Uh, my name is Allison Hall, and I played Jane Eyre on the autobiography of Jane Eyre. Neighbors Hello. being like, what's going on out there? Like, they <laughs> were ready to defend me. Um, <laughs> me being like i'm so sorry <laughs> that's that's lovely well, that was that was great though we had to be like oh it's fine it's a web series i, I was gonna say way better Probably. that that's the reaction instead of people just simply watching from their windows be like huh wonder what's gonna happen next <laughs> so it's like good samaritans are i'm way sure better. they were <laughs> hello lillian how are you today I am so good today, Piper. It's such a special day. I'm so good. I'm so glad to hear that, Lillian. Why are you doing so well in particular? Is there a special reason that you're you're so happy? Yes, there is a special reason. We have a special guest, Piper. I'm so excited. Oh my gosh. Well, maybe she should introduce herself. Um, who are you, special guest? Uh, my name is Allison Hall, and I played Jane Eyre on the autobiography of Jane Eyre, the web series. Amazing. We got Jane Eyre. She's on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> She's actually here. It's happened. We're big enough. We have Jane herself. So I think we can quit after this episode. No. I have a lot more to say. <laughs> no, don't quit, you guys. <laughs> we've, we've reached our pinnacle, but we're going to we're gonna keep going because you were just saying how you like when things get worse as time goes on. So this, oh, for those yeah. of you listening, this is our peak. <laughs> Either side of this is going to be slightly worse, and I hope you enjoy it. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, you're right. I forgot that I said that. Uh, My (laughs) famous take, um, I love when things get bad. (laughs) Yep. Classic, Piper. Oh, well. (laughs) Allison, how are you today? How are you doing? I'm doing so good. How are you guys? Doing good. Also doing really good. It's a little bit earlier for you. You were saying you're in Vancouver, so Mm -hmm. we're in the afternoon. You're a bit in the morning, but we appreciate you making the sacrifice of being here, even though it's so early for you. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so ready to talk about all things Jane Eyre with you guys. Obviously, you have this particularly special connection to Jane as you embodied her for so long. Um, But what was kind of your your way into Jane Eyre and any connection that you have to her beyond being her, obviously? Yeah, I actually, I first read Jane Eyre because uh, my younger sister, Catherine, she recommended it as as like just a bonkers story to read. I had always been into uh, English lit and all kinds of things. But for whatever reason, in high school, as well as university, um, I'd never been had to read the novel for any kind of class or anything. So it was actually her that was saying, you need to read this book. It's really interesting and really weird. <laughs> and I I fell in love with it right away. Like even all the early stuff of Jane mm-hmm. being really young and her schooling and the bullying and like immediately it grabbed me as such a like compelling and like in- unique mm-hmm. novel for the time particularly. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I with the mention of your like relationship to the childhood even too. I was actually just watching a video on YouTube that was comparing a couple of the adaptations cuz I mean that's what our podcast <laughs> is so I had to see if we were doing it better. But um <laughs> the woman in that video mentioned that it was one of the first times um an English novel had really approached uh a child's perspective. So and that didn't really occur to me, which is something I know that you Lillian have really attached yourself to is why is everyone a jerk <laughs> to kids? And it's because no one hears their side of it. So yeah, that's such a good point. Cool. We we talk a lot about how the childhood bums me out. And then I go into long rants about how you can't treat kids like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we never really talk about kind of the, the reasons behind it. So we should definitely unpack that someday in the distant future. Because today, we've got too many good things to talk about. Um, so we, we have already spent an hour plus this week gushing about how much I adore, um, the autobiography of Jane Eyre, this sort of incredible creation that you guys have. Do you want to give a little context maybe for some of those people who mistakenly haven't enjoyed this before as to kind of what it is and, and where you fit into this beautiful Jane Eyre tapestry? Yeah. Yeah. So it's quite a... 
just a series of events <laughs> that led to us making this web series. But part of it had been my sister had recommended the book to me like a few years earlier. And then I would just graduated from university with my degree in theater and acting for film a little bit. And um, Nessa, my writing partner, we had we've been friends since we were six years old and um, went to high school and elementary school together. And our high school program had a really like unique theater program where we would write our own school plays so in a sort of a group writing setting and because our like the the performance art teacher was really like inclusive he really felt the theater was a space where everyone could be included and should be and so he would never let anyone not be a part of the school play if they wanted to so we had these massive school plays of like 200 people and like 30 speaking roles so there were no plays that exist that you can like there's no midsummer night's dream really you could do <laughs> with that number of people so we'd write our own during both like after school and summer school like over the summer sort of meeting up in these groups and then write the school play for the year mm. So Ness and I got this experience of like writing collaboratively together and then we went to separate universities. She got her degree in anthropology and it had kind of been she'd always wanted to go into film and writing, but um, she's a second generation Iranian immigrant and her parents were like, you need to have a backup plan. <laughs> so um, that's what she ended up doing was anthropology and studying film through that and and internet communities in general as like an anthropology and so when we both graduated uh we were kind of looking to write together again and to write something fun and then the lizzie bennett diaries had just come out which for anyone that doesn't know is like a web series pride and prejudice version where lizzie kind of talks directly to her audience and we had kind of been midway through that and were really fascinated with just the idea of having like such a collaborative internet community that were kind of like going through the story with the character. So long story short, we, we started looking at it and saying, could we do this for something that was like a drama, for something that was more serious? And I had read Jane Eyre a couple of years ago, so I was like, well, okay, bonkers <laughs> idea. Like, could you adapt Jane? Like, let's make it as hard as we can for ourselves. Could we adapt Jane Eyre? And how would we do it? And then Nessa was like, okay, well, let me see. And she really took it on as sort of a an obstacle that we had to defeat. So we broke it all down into sort of a hundred ish episodes. And then by the end of it, we had like a structure and we were like, I guess we could just do <laughs> this now. Like it was such a sort of fun activity that we just jumped into. And, and uh, yeah, so then we did a hundred plus episodes of, of Jane Eyre in a web series format where Jane talks directly to her audience, which like, I think actually really suits like mm -hmm. the book because mm -hmm the book is like an autobiography and she even more explicitly than I think other Victorian novels like speaks to her audience in the book. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you mentioned the obstacles of this adaption. What would you think is mm -hmm. maybe the biggest challenges that you guys faced when it came to bringing this story to both a modern setting and then also this sort of one-to-one -one format? I think going in Bertha was absolutely like the thing that intrigued us the most as well as like we thought was going to be the most difficult but actually didn't end up being hugely difficult just because we brought it into a modern context and kind of figured out the intricacies of like how that could work and how we could treat like mental illness in a much more like sympathetic mm -hmm. and thoughtful fashion now that it's in sort of a modern context mm -hmm. and I think in some ways that almost made it like a little bit more understandable than even it was in Victorian times when he's like I keep my wife in the attic <laughs> <laughs> spoilers um if you but... come to earbuds <laughs> expecting a spoiler free situation yeah. I'm so sorry for you every the very first thing we do on every episode is do like a wild attempted one minute recap of the story so yes <laughs> uh I think the the actual point we found the most difficult to adapt was actually Jane running away and then being taken in by mm -hmm. the rivers because that was like not something you do modern like you don't adopt someone <laughs> you don't just find someone on the street and go you know what you should come live with us and we were like really struggling to find a way to make that like uncreepy because 
normally you just go okay this person's hurt or injured or sick like they go to the mm-hmm. hospital and now they're at the hospital and we had talked about like maybe we could just have things set at a hospital but then you're mm-hmm. filming in a hospital and it's just like that was actually the most difficult which I don't think most people would realize would be the the sticking point for us but we talked we talked that one out for like weeks probably yeah because we talked through when yeah. in that episode which I talked about the that truth episode is my favorite like how you guys both managed to tell this story of a surprisingly sympathetic Rochester because one of we've we've watched a lot of adaptions the other the only other one that has come close to doing modern without completely changing the story and like just taking inspiration is one that takes place in the 1950s so like Mm -hmm. no one has really tried to do what you guys did and you did it in this completely different format you talked about that internet community and creating it kind of in that way I so struggled to articulate exactly why this was like a special moment in the internet, a special moment in like the way you guys created this thing. And it's so impressive to hear about that. But when you guys went through the idea of why Jane left, how did you kind of come up with the approach that you were going to have to Bertha and then talking through that why Jane left I like I really loved where you guys landed with the rivers I think you really flushed that out but you you acted like these two big big problems of why does Jane leave and what's going on with Bertha were like actually easy at the end of the day and I'm sitting here and I would love to know (laughs) kind of how that inspiration (laughs) struck yeah, I mean, I, I think we just were looking at it from the standpoint of how do we make this as simple? How do we? I think Rochester's a fascinating character. I think he is so unlikable that almost it shouldn't work. <laughs> like, he does so many bad things that you should not be able mm-hmm. to forgive him for everything that he mm-hmm. does. And I think that is so intriguing and Ness and I talk a lot about how I don't think we're there yet in society with having a woman in that same situation where you can have a love interest and she does that many Mm -hmm. things wrong and you would be willing to totally forgive her and be like you know what Mr. Jane should be in a relationship with Mrs. Roger you know what I mean like you would never kind of if you turn that gender on its head how do you proceed with that relationship Mm -hmm. and I think it's just it speaks to how much like male characters in particular get to get away with things and we sort of accept that they have these downfalls and that's just like who they are Mm -hmm. for us we kind of were looking at it from like okay how do we modernize that in a way where we're kind of being sympathetic to where he's at but making his reasoning make sense even if his like reasons for doing it are Mm -hmm. broken and so that his communication and how he's able to interact with everyone is kind of the the sticking point for him that he's not very organized he's not very like good at being himself and speaking his mind or being honest but like he all his motivations Mm -hmm. were actually good and well-intentioned and I think that really like is what is good in the novel and I think that was more what we were interested in adapting was like the intentions of the novel rather than the actual Mm -hmm. like event facts so um for us it was just like approaching the story with a modern sensibility of like how do we look at mental illness what are the issues we still Mm -hmm. have right now that are with how we think of mental illness and how we deal with mental illness and like I think like Ness and I talk about it even today what we would do now like how we would change that and I think like in retrospect we would definitely give Bertha even more Mm -hmm. of a voice it's like tricky with that vlog format but I think look looking back you're always looking at how you could do something differently or better and I think we could have even gone farther with that yeah yeah absolutely and I think that's one thing that Lillian and I were definitely very curious to talk to you about is how do you feel about this project looking back on it now uh obviously I feel it's for many creators, we are our own worst critics of, you know, it's easy to mm-hmm. pick holes in something where anyone else would look at it and be like, no, it's great. Do you feel that way with this project? Do you and, and like, yeah, what are some of these specific changes you would make and why? I, th- I mean, I think for us, it was like our film school, like we kind of had never had any film training. So it's really tricky to go 
to go back mentally and say, well, I would have done that. I would have had like a better sound team. I would have, because like, obviously once you've done it, you know, all, all the things you struggled with and all the things you could have done better, probably like primarily structuring our time would have been better. So we like started out with sort of, we'd write in blocks of 10 and then shoot in blocks of 10 and sort of all stagger them and try and have be 10 ahead wherever we were at. But I would even go like 20, 30. It's like the more more time you have the better you are at like shooting mm-hmm. that stuff and getting into those intricacies in terms of story I I think there's probably like lots we could have nitpicked with but like we're so proud of it still it's so amazing that I'm even like in this interview talking about this and we have people that still like are connecting with it and even message me so often and say like you know this like helped me through a really hard time I think that everything we could have asked for in like a first major film project we ever made it was an incredible experience and i think in some ways even though like jane is such a very specific story like it's it's touches on all the things that we really care about so like friendship and love and family and who how do you make your family how do you choose your family like difficult conversations mental illness like it's all stuff that we still try to bring forth in our in our work when we do other writing and Mm -hmm. Um, I think I think we're I think overall we're we're super proud and and happy with yeah, the project. Yeah, I think that's that's so clear. Yeah. Like the passion of you guys making it without it being too much. Like you can see that in the way that you're doing it, right? Because like you can see all of the care that you guys take. I could I remember texting Piper when I was like, they made. In Twitter accounts for all these people where they're tweeting as themselves, Piper. <laughs> Here are all the Twitter accounts. They made one for the fake business they have. <laughs> like, <laughs> and just being... That was actually the most fun as we made like a website for his aluminum <laughs> business. Like we came up with Rochester is this like CEO of a big like aluminum company that <laughs> processes aluminum. I went so deep like researching <laughs> aluminum. Like I cannot tell you like how much I learned about aluminum creation we just wanted to be so boring and so oh like not, not oh. interesting <laughs> while also being kind of like something you could make a lot of money off of and I don't know aluminum Amazing. <laughs> I love because the newspaper article I was reading I was listening to you read that newspaper article when she's like hearing that rather than Thornfield Manor being th- burned down the company falls apart and she's reading the article about it Similar to if people, I was just complaining about how I read this book and the person writing it clearly didn't know anything about poker, but they made poker like a really big plot point. I was listening to that going, did they, did they research aluminum to write this article? <laughs> we did. I did so, I learned so many things on that podcast or that uh, web series. Like it was incredible. Like I, I also learned so much about the basal ganglia. Like I did a deep dive on like, like brain physiology. I like, I learned so much about how the brain works. And I remember I have a friend that is now in med school, but like was kind of, she was in science at the time. And I would send her messages and be like, so wait, so the brain so how does it work though you have hormones and like where is there one place in the brain that does like this one activity and she'd be like no we don't know like because the brain is studying itself and I'd be like oh my god like I I went so deep in on aluminum and so what I'm hearing is all of that enthusiasm that Simon had for brains was actually just you getting to sneak in your cool brain facts I mean, I had no cool brain facts prior to it. We just were like, <laughs> Simon really needs to be like super like nerdy and just very scientific and like really like kind of juxtapose all her like sort of more religious yeah. kind of background mm-hmm. and and be that sort of counterpoint to Rochester, who's all feelings and no thinking. And yeah. <laughs> all <laughs> then Simon could be all thinking and no feeling. And <laughs> so perfect. <laughs> Jane's Jane's really got to pick a middle ground. Oh my gosh, like. poor girl. <laughs> She's got the choice between like a robot yeah. and a therapy doll. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So kind of along the lines of um, Simon being a doctor instead of um, a oh, what would you even call him? Uh, someone who goes out and tries to convert people. Missionary. <laughs> um, missionary. That's it. Thank you. Um, there mm. were a couple of big changes like that. Like 
um, Jane was a nursing student, or did she complete her mm -hmm. uh, nursing degree in your story? Like, but mm -hmm. yeah, she had just completed nursing, I think. Okay. Or I, it's been How a few years. How dare you not remember every detail of this eight and a half hour thing you did <laughs> ten years ago? <laughs> um, so I'm curious to know what was sort of your decision making process when it came to big changes like that. Uh, and another one that struck me as like a really big narrative change that I thought was interesting was making um, Adele the daughter of it's essentially Rochester and Bertha. So kind of can you like chat with us about that process and how you made those choices? Yeah, I mean, um, it was a lot of just talking it through. And because we did kind of like, like kind of structuring of the whole plot, we sort of had that ability to go all the way to the end and say like, how are these decisions going to ripple out? And I think like for us, the nursing background allowed us to do a lot more of the like blood sort of things that we do in it and like kind of allow us to keep the gothic horror elements so that and and so that you kind of have yeah she's a governess she's not just like a tutor but she sort of is this like larger nursing sort of character that is there for Adele's well-being mm -hmm. and then I think for like us we talked a lot about like Adele and what like whether she should be like what her role should be it made the most sense to us that like a modern audience wouldn't at all like think it was weird that he had a daughter that was maybe from a previous marriage whereas like obviously like in the victorian times you don't just have <laughs> previous marriages so that simplicity made a lot of sense to us and we didn't see any reason like not to have that be sort of a a flag already um and I, yeah, a lot of our choices just were like about simplifying, about making it like as close to what was intended in the novel, mm -hmm. while also just like suiting our needs of like, if you make it more simple, then it's simpler to explain to an audience. It's simpler for an audience to ex like accept. And then like, you can kind of sneak in all your sort of mystery or like more complicated stuff as you go awesome. along. Very cool. Yeah, I think yeah. Lily and I definitely chatted about we loved the choice of Jane as a nurse because, right, we can have those moments where she's tending to him and it has a bit more level of believability instead of just simply the, ooh, we're doing this so they can get close and touch each other and stuff like that. So that was very good. I liked that. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and it, it makes sense from like a standpoint of like, if he has this wife that has a, a series of uh, mental illnesses that he's like treating in a separate wing of the house right like he'd want someone that was like also like capable to do any kind of nursing if that's like a role that he ended up mm -hmm. wanting her to be more involved in that like it just makes sense from a hiring standpoint that he'd want someone with medical experience yeah, absolutely so. that makes a lot of sense you mentioned specifically you talked about that idea of, of internet communities and you talked about how you still get messages of people talking about the impact that it has on it. I know when I back, went back and was like reading the comments and stuff, which was so much fun for me to kind of seeing that we actually have some people who I believe listened to the podcast who mentioned that they had still they went and looked and their comments are still there and like all this stuff and Aww. but I saw comments of people being like I'm watching this in 2020 and like I'm just having this comfort show for me in the pandemic and all that stuff I imagine the community it sounds like was something you guys created really intentionally and um, did with a lot of purpose whether it's within that community or any other aspect of making it what would you say was kind of like a surprise or something that was outside of your expectations that happened from it uh definitely the audience itself being like so eager and enthusiastic and lovely like we really went into this with almost no expectations like we sort of every step of the way went oh i guess we're still doing this <laughs> like it, it was it was really just us kind of breaking down the script and then being like oh i guess we could hire writers and then getting writers in a room and being like would you want to do this and then being like yes and then continually showing up to our writers meetings and us like having tea and snacks and talking about our day and then breaking up the episodes and writing them and then editing them and then filming them and it was really a sort of a runaway train in a way like it just was a thing that was happening and everyone said yes and we expected to hear no's at a certain point but they just like never came and 
And I think we expected not to have an audience and to kind of do it for a few weeks and then be like, well, we tried, <laughs> like, let's all move on with our summer or whatever. But an incredible experience that people like latched onto and were right there with us and like eager for more Lizzie Bennett type content and like more stuff that that had this like internet community impact. And we loved that part of like Lizzie Bennett as well, that you could like see the characters sort of interacting in real time. And, and I think one of the smartest things that I, I like had sort of um, came up with or was thinking about when we were first making it was like what are the style of like social media that each of the characters would do and and I was like kind of like incidentally lucky I had a roommate in sort of the last couple of years of university that was really into Tumblr and uh, would post all kinds of like aesthetic photos every day of just like roses and crying and you know the <laughs> tumblr things you post and um and like she ended up um like leaving so she found a, an apartment with a, a different roommate but didn't tell me but she like would she was writing about on her blog not realizing like, I was like reading her blog so it would be like found an, a, found an apartment so excited I'd be like when am I going to hear oh, about no. this and I feel like that was like almost my window in because like that's like both very gothic romantic <laughs> and also like very quintessentially Jane Eyre and, and so um, when we came to Jane Eyre I just felt right that she would have a mm -hmm. tumblr and be posting sort of these images that were vaguely suggesting her emotions and what she was thinking at the time and that she would be the type of person that like pours her heart out to mm -hmm. strangers but like it will not <laughs> have a real conversation mm -hmm. with an actual human about what she's thinking yeah. or feeling so that's so cool to hear because when we were talking about the series in our previous episode i personally was hypothesizing about something so i'd love to know your thoughts on this i was thinking that after jane left um and she continues to post these videos i said to lillian i I was like there's Rochester is like obsessively following all of this content right like d is that what you felt was he like watching every yeah. single thing and trying not to comment and oh totally like he seems like totally the kind of guy that is like on social media all the time but is like kind of not mm -hmm. posting anything like fully yeah I think he's like obsessed with her and that's the only reason he doesn't actually tell her uh, everything else in his life is that he is then suddenly like very crush shy and <laughs> so doesn't it, tell her the honest things that he should definitely be letting her in on versus like his weird games that isn't he that the difference <laughs> the, the fine line that rochester as a character walks is he's the guy who is obsessively watching your social media but he's not harassing you about it he just loves you from afar <laughs> He's oh not sending you creepy DMs or pictures of you when he's on your street. <laughs> but, Thank God. But he is watching your YouTube video of you at a dance lesson over and over and over and over and over again. Absolutely. And then he's like, you know what flirting would work is if I withhold her paycheck. <laughs> that's that's what's going to... That's what's going to get her. Oh, boy. God. Yeah, we well. <laughs> we talked about that because that is one of my, like, what a cute scene in the book and in the movies. There's, like, the ones that do it well. It's this, like, really cute flirty moment. And I told mm -hmm. Piper, I was like, I really like that. And she goes, why on earth would he have, would she have been cool with him not paying her? <laughs> what is she doing? <laughs> I was like, classic Jane. I always want to get her out of there. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I mean, of all the red flags, like that was something that stood out to me so much about watching this in a modern setting. And we talked about this too, is I feel like you can, in a, the escapism of a gothic romantic novel, I feel like we can forgive certain things. But in a modern day setting, I'm like, girl, you need that W-2 <laughs> filled out. Like, I want to see my pay going into the bank every two weeks. <laughs> like, what's going on? Come on. <laughs> I mean, having like worked on film sets and like been in charge of paying people, there are two types of people. There's a person that's like, pay me yesterday. Yes. And then this person who's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> like I, I am supposed to be getting paid for my work. And I felt like Jane was definitely that person because I am totally that person that's like, oh, yeah, I never sent an invoice in for that thing. I should definitely be being paid. Mm -hmm. That's a good oh idea. God, that's amazing. I love that so much. I love it too. I have some logistical questions and, and curiosities. 
oh. about the the filming and the production of all of this because I know Lillian went into the behind the scenes. I unfortunately didn't have time to do that de- depth of research. So also for our listeners who haven't, can you talk to us about um, like the casting uh, process? Uh, how many of these people were already your friends and people that you knew versus actors that you hired? That let's start there maybe. Um, almost all of them were people like luckily coming right out of theater school I had like a lot of actors to draw from the only downfall was that I didn't have any actors that were significantly older mm-hmm. so like that was like the main hire we did was uh, Adam for Rochester and then Adele was found because um, Erica one of our producers was a teacher for like kids small kids doing theater camps and stuff and she was like you know who'd be perfect for Adele so uh she cast Adele and then um I think that's pretty much it for outside people I think everyone else was someone I'd worked with in the past or gone to school with experience working working with in the past so we were really lucky like it ended up being like just mostly fun with friends and people and the filming of the houses like we lucked out for that one too because like Nessa's family family was so patient with us like letting us shoot there for Thornfield like there in their house in kind of like her brother's bedroom while he was away at university was kind of like that was uh such a treat like I think she probably had many headaches of like (laughs) convincing her parents to be quiet for a full day but like uh They were so patient with us and like so kind. And then um, for the rivers, we ended up shooting um, in uh, Erica's apartment for that one. And just like kindness of of friends apartments really is kind of how we managed to get by. And then just like everyone volunteering their time as much as possible. And luckily, like because we were so young, we it was kind of like everyone was like, sure, (laughs) I'll do this thing for free. So, uh, yeah, we were really lucky. I, I don't know what that would have actually cost in terms of like if we had paid everyone a fair rate and like um, paid for locations. I think that would have been a, a hugely costly <laughs> web series. Yeah, we talked about yeah. that too because I, I was – it's hard when we're comparing – all these different formats and all these different adaptions. We talk a lot about kind of the art of adaption and how people approach it and all of that stuff. And I was trying, it's, it's easy going, well, this is like filmed. So it must be like, it's easiest to compare it to a TV show or a movie. And I was like, a a movie, a made for TV, cheap movie, according to the internet averages around $65 million. I'm going to guess that you guys maybe would have made a different show if you had access to $65 million instead of a bunch of people who were having a lot of fun because they wanted to make art. (laughs) Definitely. I like, I mean, I think if I'd known, we probably would have done like a larger like call for Rochester. Like we really did such a, a little call for like older guys and were really like no one knew older actors like among my like I was doing call outs on social media being like does anyone know older actors like <laughs> like when you're 23 you just like don't have that like particularly in Vancouver I mean it might be easier in LA when you know just like a larger pool of people but like for us it was really like does anyone know anyone that's willing to work for like very cheap and wants to be a 30 year old and hang out in like a girl's bedroom for, <laughs> like, <laughs> so. and can give off creepy vibes without being creepy yeah, yeah. creepy yeah can also balance that kind yeah, of absolutely. like romantic and charming yeah. at the same time <laughs> yeah totally oh, totally that's so that's so fantastic <laughs> I was also curious about, so when you're doing shots in location outside of the houses or the apartments, like whenever you were doing, you know, Jane is alone and scared at a bus stop. um, What was that like? And like, you know, finding those places. And also how often would you be filming and someone would kind of come by and do you just keep going and pretend they're not there? Or how does that all work? Yeah, that was like, it, it, it totally, we were just going out with a DSLR and being like, uh, hopefully no one stops us. Because like, basically, at that age, also, you'll just be like, I don't know, it's a student project. And they'd be like, good for you. <laughs> like, so luckily, we got we got by with not having to 
do any permit stuff. We tried to avoid locations where we thought there might be attendants that would be more like strict with us. But for the most part, we just do like quick shots here and there. And like social media was such a big thing and like still is that kind of no one questions you walking around with a camera anymore unless it's like huge rig. Um, but like we've kept that even in our like shooting to, to date. We just shot a music video and um, we're shooting through parks and on a beach <laughs> with no permit again. And like we had a huge huge rig this time and we were just like well like <laughs> we got stopped by by one attendant and they were like what are you doing we were like oh we didn't know we needed a permit we're just students so I mean you can get away with so much I think the funniest day was when we did the car crash episode with uh, the dog and we were like kind of in this park alcove that like had housing around it and we like had kind of driven the car very slowly to make it look like it was in the ditch and then we'd do this whole thing where we like would cut between her like dropping the camera and then having this like car accident thing but like um adam had to come out like yelling be like hey what have you done with my car and like we had like several like neighbors come out like guy neighbors oh, no. being like what's going on out there like they <laughs> were ready to defend me um <laughs> From Adam, at a moment's notice, they saw this scary tall man with a big dog, and like me being like, "I'm so sorry." That's that's lovely. Well, that was that was great though. We had to be like, "Oh, it's fine. It's a web series." I gotta assume that's Canada. Like, I love the idea of that happening anywhere, yeah. but it also feels very Canadian to me. I was gonna say way better Probably. that that's the reaction instead of people just simply watching from their windows, be like, "Huh, wonder what's gonna happen next." <laughs> so it's like, Good Samaritans are. I'm way sure better. they were. <laughs> Uh, I bet we looked like a bunch of weirdos honestly like we were in Granville Island we were all over the place like running through fields like Nessa was like filming backwards a lot of the time like trying not to trip on roots it was like such a such a wild experience speaking of the car crash though we've talked a lot about different options for uh, somebody running you down on a horse and the intro how did you land on the car crash and and I do have a follow-up question around like kind of the way that you guys use the format of vlog and how that led to some pretty unique cinematography moments. (laughs) But start with explaining, talk, let's talk through the car crash. Yeah, I think for, I I don't remember that being like a a very like difficult adaptation point. I think we were just like, like car makes sense have some kind of like, yeah, actual, like, I think the wildest thing is that um, someone must have pitched like car crash and no one at any point was like, that sounds really hard to do. Like, I think I think maybe Nessa was like, I don't know how we're going to do this. And we were all like, don't worry about it. We'll just like park it in the ditch. We'll do like this shot and then this shot. And don't worry about it. And like, we just did it. So I feel like uh, there's so much to be said for like being young and just yeah just going out and doing it. So that's definitely how we ended up with that. And I think it, it actually turned out so great. Like, in, in the end of the cut, it uh, it does look like a, a believable ish car crash, but something dramatic definitely happened. Where I do I do wonder how he injured just his ankle, but you know, there's a bit of what will be will be. <laughs> He's a tall yes. man. <laughs> Yeah, he rolled it. He just it turns out that was actually just getting out of the car. Like he's just he's That's just what I was yeah, saying. <laughs> just so angry Falling. on the exit that he just, you know, gives a little twist. <laughs> He's he's the kind of psychopath that maybe he didn't even have an injured leg. He just he wants to he wants you to know that he they, he was put in a bad situation and you're yeah, you're to blame for such it. A Classic Rochester. Always always <laughs> someone else at fault. <laughs> doing doing weird choices that man the cinematography and stuff and i i piper was a film major or film minor in college Mm -hmm. i have no real background so i have no leg to stand on or the right words to use um but like in terms of like doing that sort of vlog thing and having her record people without their knowledge and then kind of dancing into getting a very soft permission of like don't bother turning it off jane (laughs) how did you guys sort through all those plot points and I imagine that being a real struggle of this format. Yeah, that was definitely one of the harder things that like 
kept being hard like you would you would come up with like a reason why the camera was on and then you'd have to keep coming up with reasons why the camera was on and it didn't always like land perfectly but you at a certain point you kind of were like well the camera needs to be on for anyone to watch it so no one's gonna fight us that hard on it being on as long as it's not like super like negative consent Mm -hmm. sort of stuff and you could always have jane being like Um, I probably shouldn't show you this, Mm -hmm. but like, Mm -hmm. then you'd be like, oh, at least morally she understands this is wrong to some extent. (laughs) Yeah, it was definitely like a difficult sticking point. I think for us, like actually one of the most inspiring things for the cinematography of that was like Marble Hornets, Mm -hmm. actually, like the Slender Man stuff that was kind of happening just before all like that was kind of one of the first web series along with like lonely girl 15 and stuff was this kind of found footage cloverfield sort of like the camera is a character blair witch stuff where you can kind of have the camera alone and like you as the audience feel like abandoned and isolated so we sort of were playing with that of like that's a, an easy way to get that gothic sort of like mm-hmm. feel of like having the ring and having the kind of glitches mm-hmm. happen and playing with all that kind of fun stuff for for the gothic feels the gothic is not really why i come to jane Eyre. i'm very easily afraid <laughs> and i don't like her it genuine those those, per, those two episodes in particular where we watch bertha come into her room i was like this might I have to watch it during the day. This might be a bit too far for me specifically. <laughs> I thought that was one of your um, stronger moments was her falling asleep with the camera on so we can see that spooky shot. And then also it definitely felt very Blair Witch, the whole I'm at a bus stop and it's not here and I'm alone. And you do feel that anxiety. So no, that was well done. That was actually, um, I don't know if anyone knows <laughs> Vancouver like layout, but it's actually at the bottom of Grouse Mountain was when we shot that like bus station footage. And it was kind of in the off season. So people weren't going up for skiing or anything, but like that was definitely the location I got the most like weird looks, but I was <laughs> pretty much vlogging nessa showed up like halfway through the filming of it but i was pretty much like <laughs> filming alone just like fil- filming myself actually and it was like the most sort of like method acting <laughs> vlog of all of them because i really was starting to feel alone and like worried and sort of was putting the camera away in sort of the same same way she was and yeah. and uh i think the actual um footage of that turned out really well it's like very spooky mm-hmm. and like mm-hmm. i don't know i i like that episode a lot i would love to talk to you allison about because we talked a lot about like the production and and you as a writer but also if we could go into a bit of you as an actress as well since jane Eyre is such a beloved character and you said you read the book previously of course but what sort of preparation did you do personally to try to get into her mindset to understand her and then to bring her to a modern setting i think the book has so much like rich detail about her inner thoughts and and what she's going through and and what she's been through and how lonely she is and i think that was like primarily the thing that i like latched on to was just that like jane is such a like kind and like generous person but like the self-confidence isn't there like for because of like her upbringing and the bullying and the the trauma she's been through and then it's just about being like so lonely like what's the what's the kind of person that is so lonely that they make kind of their own imaginary friend in a way with the camera right like Mm -hmm. yeah maybe she's like um messaging with these audience members and sort of knows them a little bit better but for the most part like if you're kind of talking to someone every day into the camera that's you're creating sort of a friend to talk to and I think that that's that's sort of what I focused on is just how lonely she is that's really cool and I definitely picked up on how and we talked about this too in the previous one that I think one of the strongest things of the production was uh, Jane's growth as a as a person we see that confidence build and I thought it was really great that the way that you ended it is sort of her being like I don't really need to have this camera as a friend anymore now that she's found her family um, yeah. so that played out very well 
Yeah, I, I love that part of the book, too, is that, like, she kind of learns even, like, early on in the book that, like, you can choose your own family, that, like, your family you've been given sometimes is not, like, your ideal situation. And then she meets her friend at school and, and like, that becomes, like, her new way of surviving. And I think that's true of, like, everywhere she is in her journey, she just, like, latches on to people and makes friends. And that's sort of how she survives is through friendship and through um the people that she meets so like i think that 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 growth came very naturally to us that it she came from a place of like absolute like having no one and and was able to get to a place where she had people that had her best interests at heart and like loved and supported Aww. her that's so Aww. lovely yay yeah I, so the, the <laughs> book itself is obviously a huge inspiration for you guys and i see a lot of that we obviously watch a lot of different interpretations of this story. And one of the things that we talk about a lot in, as we look at um, kind of the art of adaption and taking a story and, and recreating it is how much is inspired by the original text versus how much the different interpretations are sort of in conversation with each other. And I really felt like your guys's was very clearly deeply inspired by the book. Was there any other influence in some of the other adaptions? You talked about some other sort of storytelling methods and things but did you guys have influence from other adaptions or did you guys really stick with the book as our source we really kind of stuck with the book for the most part i had watched some of the adaptations sort of along the process of just like like what is this like there's the i can't remember what you'll remember what uh year it is but it was with the the tree and the lightning and it's like black and white is it, and, like, is, is, it, it for, is it the one with orson welles um yeah, that's yeah, 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 that one. I have yeah. to know this. Yeah. I would never know if I didn't. <laughs> I have all the years in my head because I do our Instagram hashtags. Yeah. That is the main reason. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, like, I, I watched that one. We watched some of the other ones. I actually, like, the thing that I um, – I sort of stumbled upon just like through watching things was like how much I think the sound of music is a Jane Eyre adaptation. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not, but hear me out. Like if, if <laughs> the Lion King is Hamlet, like it kind of, it kind of is Jane Eyre because she's a governess and he's unhappy and then they do fall in love and in a way Bertha is the Nazis but like you, just, you kind of have to yes you sort of have to do a leap but it, I think it's all there they I'm, you know they fall in love they run I'm away together that is enough structure I love it. to add so sound of music to our adaption list I think you have to. No, and I'm so glad that you said that, Allison, because I've been thinking the exact same thing, and I was going <laughs> to propose it to Lillian that we have it as a palate cleanser, yes. so now it's got to happen. Um, we yeah, to. we just watched Little Women, and that was one that, like, I didn't know the story of Jane Eyre when we had when I first experienced Little Women and like we watched the 94 one and there's literally a line that is from the book where Aunt March says mm -hmm. who would marry governesses <laughs> and we're just like Rochester <laughs> Mr. Rochester would he does Rochester <laughs> would <laughs> so good do you have a um, a favorite of other Jane Eyre versions um, apart from the book maybe you don't have to know any references just allude to it and we'll know I love the Fastbender one personally. Nice. I'm a big fan of the Fastbender one. I think, I think that's got some good moodiness. I mean, who can say no to Fastbender? He's <laughs> Piper can say no to Fastbender. <laughs> she... I... <laughs> you accidentally, you've it's accidentally me. stumbled into an Airbuds debate that has been going on because oh, Piper no. <laughs> came to Jane Eyre for Timothy Dalton. He was my Rochester. Fair, mm -hmm. fair. I think there. one thing that I've learned from engaging with the Jane Eyre community is that everyone's, whoever was your first Rochester is typically your ride or die Rochester. So I think we all have our, our favorites. For sure. <laughs> Where For I, sure. on the other hand, have some problems with the 83, which is why, so we are, we are reading the book. I know it's, we, sh we arguably should have done it before. It's happening now. Calm down. <laughs> I think it's more fun that you didn't. Like, honestly. Thank like... you. We need the recognition I was fishing. Yeah. It's like what you said, where your sister came to you and she's like, hey, here's a crazy story. She's and so. Like, it's bonkers. Yeah. It's bonkers. Um, but I, on the other hand, watched the 
83 version. It was my first full version of Jane Eyre. And I was like, this is really upsetting. They're mean to her when she's a little kid. And then this guy who she works for yells at her all the time. And then it turns out after all this gaslighting, he's married. Get out. Stay out. And I'm like... (laughs) I'm like, but Lillian, but Lillian, but Lillian, he's seven <laughs> feet tall. His hair is so thick and dark. I mean, the dimples. He's, <laughs> he's so intense. I feel like that's the that's the issue with Rochester almost, like with all the actors portraying him. It's like you need to have this like in crazy mm-hmm. intensity of like, you are a fairy and I'm in love with you. Mm-hmm. Like just like next level intensity of that's almost disconcerting but then you also need to be kind of like soft and be like here i got you this gift like and it's not every actor that can play both things and i feel like fastbender mm-hmm. does tend to be more towards the intensity side than mm-hmm. like the soft he's, boy he's side he's got really good <laughs> soft boy moments uh, where we actually we have some rewatches on our list because we think that like i might enjoy the 83 now um, and I have convinced Fiverr that she needs to re- rewatch The Fast Bender. So we, we've we mm-hmm. got him on the list. And I, I like that you're in my corner on this one. Feels good. <laughs> uh, I actually think I've got a good segue for one of my last questions, which is, so we talking about this right now, obviously, we all know the story and many versions of it. Um, and I feel like typically Jane Eyre community are people who are like, invested in this and have been for a long time looking back on when you were posting your videos week by week and people were commenting and engaging with this content do you get a sense of how many of the people watching were already Jane Eyre fans versus people who had no idea the source material was there any sort of sort um sense of that I think the I might the impression I got from on the other side of the screen was that the majority of people had read Jane Eyre or experienced Jane Eyre to some degree. Mm -hmm. But like, there were a few people that would say like, I, I'm not reading it until like I finish, like I want to be surprised by the web series and want to kind of go along for the ride. And so there was someone that was like reading along with the web series. So they'd like watch. Yeah. They'd watch like an episode and then they'd kind of read up until the episode and then, they'd watch so I I mean everyone watches it a different way so I like I'm surprised the number of people that would go into it not having seen it but I guess that speaks to like how how good it was or how how it drew people in so that that feels good I was gonna say that's gotta be um maybe even some creator pressure to be like I might be my show might be someone's first introduction to Jane Eyre wow (laughs) (laughs) For sure, for sure. I'm glad we didn't think of it like that at the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we were just kind of like, let's make this weird thing. I think it helped that we weren't like big Jane Eyre fans mm-hmm. going into it. We were just kind of like, oh, here's this like fun book that um, is like going to be difficult to adapt and is going to be a fun challenge and that we can kind of do on our like off time from awesome. work and stuff. Um, and uh, and and then it turned into something. Yeah. magical and into lots, a lot of long nights with <laughs> did you did you kind of we've talked a lot about our experience of how the way you feel about the story really evolves the more time you sit with it and the more you there's so much in the story and in the book and in what um we have from charlotte bronte that did you feel really differently about particular aspects of it or about the character kind of as you spent more time sitting with her Definitely. Like, I feel like we kind of went into it just sort of choosing it, like, not at random, but like kind of at random. And, um, and the more like we dug into it, and the more we like worked on it, the more I was like, wow, like, there's so much in here, like, even like all the like character stuff, like from an acting standpoint, there was so much to draw from there's so much description of her. She's so strong and yet like, so like vulnerable at the same time and I think she does it so effortlessly in that book like it's it's such a a a rich character like all of them are really Mm -hmm. rich characters I think and doing that justice was like it it was great it was it was a challenge but it was um it gave us a lot to work with and I think like by the by the end we were like oh Mm -hmm. we love this book like we love this story (laughs) there's so much going on in it and it really like uh gave us um 
a platform with which to like explore all kinds of things like we got to go outside we got to do horror we got to do mm -hmm. comedy we got to do romance so like I think that was the best gift honestly nice. in the end awesome what would you say is one of your biggest takeaways from this project that you still think back on or build off of in projects that you make now either as a, a writer a creator or an actress Oh, that's such a good question. Um, so many things. I feel like we learned so much about how important it is to like make your writing room and like your just everyone on set like a family as much as you can. Like really look after everyone, um, check in with everyone, make it really like a like wonderful warm space like because that is when it feels like the easiest to work for sure it's not when you're like in a time crunch pressure like like come on we got to get this sort of energy that's that's when it's like no no good whereas like when you're all friends just having a good time like you come up with like some of our greatest episodes and and um and then i think just structure like we learned so much about like how to actually shoot things like how to structure things how to how to like edit things how to like what kind of time you need in order to do those things um how to cool down a camera with frozen peas <laughs> when it's reheated for the third time during the summer you know like you get um you get really like a hands-on experience of like what it is to, to to shoot a whole film and really like we went into it being like oh this is just like some cute videos but at the end of the day like it's like we made several feature yeah. films kind of end to end like it was uh, uh many many short films 100 yeah. short films in really um a year and so so um yeah i think just like ev we learned everything from it um how to how to have a good time how to write how to um how to edit how to do That's everything lovely Very and cool. wonderful well i we eventually have to stop talking to you although we could talk to you forever about this piper and i have to cut ourselves off a lot on these because we could just talk for a really long time <laughs> i don't have i've got all my pre-written questions through piper do you have anything else you wanted to ask before we find out what Allison's up to now because she hasn't been just sitting in a time capsule I assume waiting for this interview for 10 years no I, I would love to hear Allison what what your current projects are and, and what we can help uh, get in front of our audience for you Absolutely. So we did do a short film a couple years ago called The Mirror, and that's available on Alter as well uh, as streaming on YouTube. So you can check that one out. That was directed by Nessa and written by both of us. Um, we both worked on Jane Eyre. And then we've just finished shooting uh, a death metal music video. And maybe not your audience necessarily, but maybe maybe they could be. Maybe they're just waiting to be yeah. huge death metal fans. Or maybe they are. I mean, you know, we all have diverse and dynamic and big interests. feelings feels really Jane Eyre. It's about yeah. big feelings, guys. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's gothic, it's horror mm -hmm. in a way. So um, it's called The Servant of the Outer Dark. Oh and the God. band is called 13 Goats. Um, <laughs> if you're a Stephen King fan at all, it's kind of got some references to Dark Tower in it. So this is um, amazing. You know, it's influenced. Is, is this out now? When is this coming out? Yeah, yeah. So by uh, the posting date of this podcast is in. Yeah. Uh, so it will be out okay. next week, which so will it, be it previous. It'll yeah. be back in time it's, for anyone it's, listening. Yeah, the now. 18th is when this episode is going to go out. The 18th of July. So if it's already out, mm -hmm. yeah. So it'll be it'll be out, but it'll be available on YouTube. So if you go 13 Goats, awesome. it'll be at their YouTube channel. We'll make sure to get that posted with the episode. So our listeners don't have to go poking around on the internet. If you've been enthralled by this concept already, as I have, <laughs> we'll put it right in the episode description so you can go watch that music video. Although, Allison, I need to know, were you just behind the camera for this? Or are you out there screaming on the beach into your microphone? <laughs> No, uh, just behind the camera okay. on this one, but you can you can sense my energy okay, through cool, the cool, whole cool, thing. Cool, cool, cool. Amazing. So, um, yeah, Ness and I co-directed this one. So this is our first, like, co-directing nice. project officially. Obviously, I've been co-directing <laughs> with her all through Jane Eyre for the most part, but uh, this is the nice. first time on paper, so... Well, if our listeners want to find not just your projects, but are there ways for people to follow you and kind of keep updated with what you're working on, what you're doing... 
I'm at uh, Allison Hall on um, on Instagram or uh, I believe Allison Hall on Facebook okay. as well. You can follow Great. me. Great. Any of those places. And um, I think I'm on Twitter at Pizza Meow, please. It's my favorite handle. I think I'm on Twitter. <laughs> Makes me really feel like you're on Twitter a lot. You spend a lot of time there. It's a top platform for you for sure. <laughs> An awesome way to get connected. Oh, great. <laughs> Uh, not on Twitter a lot, but uh, I, that's actually my favorite. I was at like a big panel for like uh, Lizzie Bennett Diaries and, and all of their kind of cross promotion. And they were like, what's your handle? What's your handle to all the actors? And they were like, this is my handle. It's my name. And then they got to me and I was like, it's a uh, pizza meow, please. <laughs> That's how I feel anytime out, in my like adult work setting when someone needs to send me something strictly through Google, which I don't have a professional Google for. So I'm like, oh my gosh, please don't judge me. It's devil's daydream <laughs> at gmail.com. <laughs> uh, I made it when I was in high school and I thought I was really cool and edgy. So <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, you are. No, I, think, I think you got to go with the unique handles. That's the spirit of yeah. the actual internet. Yeah. Um, Exactly. Before this professional <laughs> capitalism stuff. That's so true. <laughs> Crazy. Um, well, on that, on that <laughs> note, what's with capitalism? Have cool handles. Speaking of cool handles, our, <laughs> all of ours are at Airbuds. You can find us on all mm -hmm. the uh, social. We're on Twitter all the time. Um, and Instagram, we've talked about it. We've got our great community there. Um, you can chat with people about what your thoughts were on our spectacular interview um and this really really cool um project that allison and her fantastic team made um and you can also email us airbuds at gmail.com mm -hmm. and uh if this has really wet your whistle for jane air content uh we're going back to the source material next week we have some new chapters that we've read and are ready to talk about and they're big ones. Oh, I'm so emotional. I'm, I have one last chapter in that so section to read, and I'm definitely going to go re back and like reread it. This is the section before. We're doing a lot of timey wimey with the book, guys. I'm sorry oh, about we're it. We're all over the place. Okay. <laughs> this well, is the one that we have actually. Never mind. That's a good section. We have too. already recorded this one. We are going to be releasing a shorter <laughs> episode through this feed that you're listening to. Because we talked about it for over two hours, guys. So that one is going on our website if you really want to hear our awesome insights. Um, we did chapters mm -hmm. 15 through 20. We'll have both that extended episode available on our website as well as a more trimmed down, um, kind of just those peak highlights for a mere hour <laughs> in your feed. So um, we, we really appreciate you guys listening. And we so appreciate Allison for being here. I have been genuinely so excited to chat with you. I've told too many people about it. And we just so appreciate getting to chat with you about this amazing thing that we all have this special love for. So, Oh, thank you so much for having Yay. me. And thank you for joining us and giving us a look behind the scenes. It's been great. Oh, thank you so much. It was so lovely yeah. meeting you both. Oh, yay. And same with you. <laughs> um, but until next week, uh, happy Jane Eyre reading and watching, everybody. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye.